uh, for me, uh, it's not a job. What I have today, it's, it's more like a hobby. It's a passion. It's what I do is I don't feel that I'm working. Business of Architecture, episode 369. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week, I am speaking with Arno Zanier, founder of the Zanier Hotel Group. Now, this is a must listen to those firms who are interested in working in high-end hospitality. Now, Arno entered into hospitality after a successful career running his own fashion brand. He's no stranger to building empires and building luxury brands. His father, Roger Zanier, is a famed self-made fashion baron and industrialist in France and is the founder of the Kidelez Group. Um, when building the Zanier Group brand, Arnaud's focus was on creating an alternative luxury experience, which led to developing a series of hotels in extraordinary locations from the French Alps to Cambodia to the Namibian savannah to most recently in Vietnam. And architecture and interiors and design culture has been an instrumental part in how Arnaud has crafted this unique brand experience. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Arno Zanier. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Arno, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Good morning. Thank you very well. Excellent to meet and see you. So you are a hotelier. You're um, the founder of the Zanier Hotel Group, which is in a unique collection of hotels um, across the world. You've got a background in fashion as well. Right. Um, and, you know, you're, the hotel group, you've got, you've got, hotels in France, Cambodia, Namibia, Vietnam, some really extraordinary locations. Uh, and obviously hospitality in 2020 has been one of the, probably one of the more difficult um, industries to be working in, certainly. Um, how, how, did, how did the Zania Group begin? Okay, so uh, like you said, I've uh, been raised in the uh, fashion industry family. Um, and uh, myself after school decided to also create with a friend a fashion brand in, in, into the footwear business. Um, right. I was also based in London at the time and then moved back to Belgium because my ex-wife was from there at the time. So um, yeah, it was quite a, a, a nice story because we started also from a blank piece of paper from scratch and created a, you know, quite a, a unique small footwear brand. Hmm. Um, but after a few years, I mean, the success was, you know, was, uh, I would say, you know, fine, but, uh, family business called me back and, uh, <laughs> and my father asked me to, uh, you know, to join the family again. And, uh, and at the time I said, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to come back and, and work with uh, the family background and environment, but uh, I would prefer to create something new. Yeah, um, and um, and that was uh, yeah, it was about twelve years ago, and at this time I was driving a lot also for the fashion industry for my business, and uh, I couldn't really find the type of hotel that uh, um, fulfill my need or my philosophy, um, my way of living really, um, and uh, based on my values. So it was really personal, but. Uh, it, it, it was not based on a marketing study or that sort of thing. It was re something really, really personal. And uh, then I had the chance to have, you know, a family who can back me up and say, okay, um, uh, if you have any, just let's try. And uh, a few months later, my dad called me back and said, uh, you know, there's a real estate opportunity in, uh, in Majeb in France, in a, you know, this small uh, ski destination. Um, and maybe you can start, you can try and can be like kind of a laboratory for you. And I said, okay, let's go, let's try. But I knew nothing about the, you know, the basis of the hotel business. I just had some 
feeling as a consumer uh, what I would like to see in a perfect hotel in my eyes. Yeah. Um, but this is how it all started, really. Um, so, so the, the properties in France, the chalets, they were the they were the first ones. Yes, that was and, the first one. Yeah, and the property. And, and what was the what was the culture or the aspirations that you were trying to accomplish there? No, uh, the DNA of the brand today is the DNA of the brand that I created ten years ago, which right. was uh, based on the um, you know a sense of uh, of the location of the local cultures, um, the respect of the building, respect of the environment, trying to create a place um, that emphasizes all the local values and uh, and and give the opportunity for foreigners coming to us, staying in that region. Um, and staying with us to have a true local experience. Um, so this is how, I mean, this is the basic of our DNA, of course. Uh, then, then the DNA of the brand has evolved while we were uh, implementing and, and creating new places. Mm. Uh, but this is still the base today. I mean, for me, the most important point is that make sure that when people are staying with us is going to have the best local experience, being able to meet with the local communities, being able to uh, to test the local food, to, um, you know, to visit the cultural side around to and to be really immersed into this local culture. This this is the base of the of our brand. really. So, so when you when you first came up with the with the concept and the idea, and you you saw the real estate opportunity, what were some of the first things that you needed to put into place in order to start the business? I mean, you know, the first um, element in most of the project, once you've identified location, uh, of course, is to secure the location. So there's all the deal process that takes also quite some time. You know, it's not like, oh, I like this place. Let's go for it. No, it takes, you know, sometimes nearly two years in order to secure to deal. And then you've got all the license process, uh, which is very important as well, um, because designing, you know, a new place is always good but it comes also with an entire um, legal administrative process, uh, which is not as nice most of the time. And it depends also from destination to destination because cultures are different, process are different. And uh, it's something very important, you know, as as we uh, mainly talk about architecture and and, uh, today, uh, all these legal aspects is is very key um, to succeed as well. Um, so uh, Mejev, yeah, it was about two years of uh, getting into the uh, all the legal aspect and, and getting the, the site secured and then design, uh, process the license, and then you start to build. So in terms of uh, of concept, it was very simple. It was to create a typical French chalet with a lot of stone, uh, wood, uh, very warm colors, um, uh, create a very cozy uh, atmosphere uh, because this is what you expect when you go to uh, you know a chalet in the mountain in the winter uh, after a long ski um, day um, you know you, you just want this comfort yes uh, this coziness so um, this is what we've tried to create uh, a lot of fireplaces in you know, most of the rooms in the living room of course um, and um, yeah it's with we've a very uh, you know, one of the key element from for us in all aspects of our business is this humble approach. So it starts from the design and the concept itself. We try to be very honest, very uh, true, um, and and quite humble in the way we do things. Uh, not just in terms of service, but also in terms of design. So we're not trying to impress our customers. We want them to feel good. From the moment they enter our hotels, I want them to feel that, like they've been there, they feel good, they find their mark straight away, and they just want to enjoy the moment with their family or with their friends. Yeah. How how once you've kind of gone through the long lengthy process of licensing and getting the buildings refurbished and and built, and you know you've got your design teams. How what's the what's the next process in terms of you know, making sure that you've got guests coming in. Mm. So, of course, once all the construction uh, period is is done, um, 
then a few months before the opening. For me, Le Chalet was the first one. So I had to start from scratch. I was just by myself. So when my father called me and said, okay, we've got a location, go for it. You're like, okay, I have to start the entire new business from zero, from just an idea where like, okay, we can do the investment. Let's go yeah. for it. So, uh, so the first one was a little bit more complex, as you can imagine, because I had to find the right profile and recruit, but we don't, you know, didn't have this big budget in order to recruit a lot of people and then skill people. So the, the charrette was really based on pure ideas that I have in my head and my stomach, really. Mm-hmm. And um, I've, uh, I've worked with uh, OHL, I don't know if you know it, called the Lausanne, which is an hospitality uh, yes. school, one of the most famous in, in Switzerland. So I, uh, I asked them to help me just for like three weeks, they came to explain me what are the basis of the of this business. You know what mistake not to do, what things you should look at for, and um, so uh, this is all it started. And then uh, meeting with the with the team uh, that advises for for a couple of months, then uh, I found the girl that was a young student from the school who was in her first year at a called the Lausanne consultancy uh, right. branch. And I found the girl quite interesting and she understood what I had in my mind in terms of DNA, in terms of values, which was quite um, against the grain at the time, because you know, in 2009, 10, uh, when we were looking at this program, luxury hospitality was all about bling bling and impressive uh, design. Michelin star chef, grand designers. And so with, with this approach that we had, it was uh, really the opposite of what the market was demanding or what the, the other brands are, were offering at the time. Um, so it was not easy to find people that would understand what mm-hmm. I had in mind in terms of approach. But then I started to build my team slowly um, around me and... Um, and it started with just a couple of uh, girls working with me, one on the design, the other one on more operations side. And we've opened this hotel with just all those fresh ideas, fresh approach, uh, but in a very amateur way, I would say. But still trying to position uh, in Mejev uh, a five-star product in price positioning that was like nearly 30% more expensive than the most right. expensive product in town. So it was a bit ambitious, uh, but it worked. So, you know, after just a couple of seasons, we found our customer base that understood those values, understood this positioning and mm. loved it and adopted. Well, and uh, in Le Chalet, 10 years later, we can see that we have so many repeaters. Most of the time, people are just booking from one year to the other. Right. Amazing. Uh, so, uh, what, what, what were some of the, the sort of those core values that were helping you redefine your interpretation of what luxury is or what, what could be a new addition to the luxury market. That's a very, it's a very difficult market to kind of last in and to, and to, and to kind of exist in. Uh, I think we, in most of our tales, we have a sense of timeless in everything we do as well. Uh, of course, starting with the design uh, because we inspired by this local culture and local architecture um, way of living um so it's it's really the foundation really of, of the idea and uh, um, when people are, are coming towards us and staying with us they this is what they're looking for i guess you know they're not looking it's, it's wealthy people that have been traveling around the world that have been trying all kind of new concept fancy and but i guess when you want to really enjoy a family or a moment with friends, you just want to feel good. And, and I think it's another criteria that we try to master mm-hmm. is the emotion side of our business, right. the emotional side of our business, which is uh, not so easy, I think, for the big corporate brands to create because they are too big, because... There's a hierarchy. There's so many people taking decisions. I mean, 
our strengths is is the fact that we are small and that um, you know I'm I'm heading a small team, but it's still with the same spirit, the same ideas, and and we don't do any compromises. Mm. Um, and this is how I think we can create those special moments for guests. Um, and, and of course, you need to have the entire team believing in those ideas with you that and standardize the ideas and then can procure, communicate that to, to our guests. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of, a, uh, it's not tangible. It's not, it's something else. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of big companies in this business, you know, they do things by the book. They do things because they've been done like this for 30 years. When I came into this business, I didn't look at what are the standards or what are address to the, the, the position of being the guest and what would I would love to experience and see and, and do things when I'm staying in this hotel. So I'm, uh, very 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 lucky being able to create the perfect hotel for myself and and share that with other people that probably share same values and same approach how 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 did your experience in the fashion world come through or 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 those the skill sets that you that are needed in the fashion world how do they get employed now in I think this industry yeah i think it's um i don't know but I believe that a lot of the approach can, are similar. I mean, very similar because um, when you create a product for gas, it's the same footwear, clothes, and, and um, it, it, we apply the same principle where we were designing a footwear collection for ourselves. What was the best use for? Because it came out with more or less the same ideas, you know, 10, 15 years before the hospitality world. It was like we were looking at the market. It was living in London. Uh, a lot of sneaker brand, a lot of very classic footwear brand, but nothing in between. Mm. So we try to, um, you know, modernize more or less the what we call it the brown shoe market with the leather shoe market and trying to, to be a little bit more contemporary by giving a twist to those classic because and and i think you can find within this uh, hotel business more or less the same approach where i like um i like the classic side where i mean the respect of tradition the respect of um of the key element that um, you know make our business how it is today uh, so a respect of those key values, having this uh, a deep respect for people that have been doing this business for generation and generation and for tour business the same. You know, we had a lot of working with a lot of artisans. We were dealing with the best Italian tanneries. And, and I think within our business today, our hospitality business, we're trying to do more or less the same with the respect of what is the tradition in our business, you know, in terms of service, in terms of... Uh, um, the kindness, you know, uh, service is a key element. We talk about architecture uh, most of the time when people are, you know, uh, interviewing uh, us, we, we would talk a lot about the, uh, the architect side for business because it's, it's, I would say we have a fresh approach. We have a different approach that, you know, strikes most of the professional from the hospitality brand. I mean, and we've been recognized with so many prices every time yeah. we want a new product. Uh, but of course, it's only, let's say, 50%, maximum, even less. 50% of the success of our hotels is the genuine service that we also procure to our guests uh, through our staff and our managers. Um, so selecting the right managers that will be able to drive this team with the spirit of being a real hotelier. So many of the GMs that are, you know, general managers that are working uh, for us today, they came working for Zanier because, I mean, initially they were curious and now we've got a few more products around the world. So people hear about us and about our approach and they're coming because they say, at least I can do my real job, which is mm -hmm. welcoming customers, being close to the customers and, and create something unique for them with, with the staff. In so many companies today, they're caught up into so much administrations, reporting, figures, financials, 
that they are so far from the origin of their business, which is, uh, you know, just welcoming uh, and being present for your guest. So I'm really trying to keep the reporting and all these aspects as light as possible in our group, even if we are growing, even if we need some control. But for me, it's essential that even if we grow, that we keep, um, you know, the service and the, the true origin of hospitality service as the core pillar mm. uh, of a brand. It's, uh, and you can read it in, in a lot of... Uh, uh, comments from guests after they stay with us in Kumbatang was striking because for me it was Kumbatang or, or hotel in Cambodia was our second hotel to open. So it was a very key milestone in our story. Uh, Le Chalet was important, of course, because it was number one. And it was uh, for me the opportunity to create what I had in mind. But the number two, Cambodia, was key because it was the first time that I could um, expose uh, this brand value, this new uh, concept, or mm. new approach to the international market, because in Mejev it's very French. You don't, I mean, at the time, only French operators were working in the village. You know, a strong one, uh, very strong local families, but no international brand. But when we decided to open in Cambodia, um, then in front of us we had a man group. Raffles, Parquet, Accor, Alina, all of them, you know, all the big boys, <laughs> they were all there. So for us, in order to exist uh, on the international market, because that was my personal ambition when, you know, when I embarked the family into this new venture of hospitality, mm. um, you know, I had ambitions <laughs> from yeah. day one. It was not just to do one hotel and, and uh, you know, it, it's not an hobby. It was a real perspective with a, a real um, business model, uh, business yeah, approach, I would say, in the hospitality. So it was very important to succeed in launching this hotel, second hotel in Cambodia. How, that, that's, that's quite a big departure, wouldn't you say, from, from being in France and then the remotes or, or such, a, such a different climate, if you like, yeah. in yeah. Cambodia. How did, the, how did the idea for opening up a... Uh, a hotel in Cambodia. Um, so uh, Cambodia came into kind of an opportunity because we as a family had a foundation at the time uh, because my first group was uh, specialized in the fashion industry for kids. So we had a foundation where we were financing orphanage houses uh, in Cambodia. We right. have two. And so he's been traveling to Cambodia for, for some years. And uh, when I started this, hospitality program he said you should have a look maybe we've made some investment there we've got some piece of land that he wanted to keep for future you know and uh said, maybe there's a land that is right uh, to build an hotel so um, went there visited the different sites and then we had a you know beautiful site um, just outside uh, Simrat at this time today we're nearly in the city center because this city has grown so much it's unbelievable um, and then we said, okay, let's go for it. So it was based on an opportunity, this new concept of hotels. Siem Reap was uh, you know, a very cool destination in terms of um, you know, cultural destination, Southeast Asia. Um, and, and for me, it was also this opportunity to show the international market what we are able to, you know, to deliver and, uh, and also test this this idea with uh, with the big international brand being present in that destination so it was very important and i've been lucky i don't know when i don't know if it's luck i don't know if you know when when you work hard and and you're ambitious you seize also opportunities i don't know how i, I cannot explain but yeah the, this opening was very successful uh, uh of course you know it uh, um, and today, the, the uh, Pumatang, this hotel, is being you know, mentioned as one of the mm-hmm. reference hotel in Simrak, if not the reference hotel, even though you have all those big brands. Um, and and it- I mean, financially, anyway, we can say, because we can prove <laughs> that in terms of ADR, in terms of occupancy, is uh, one is the best performing hotel. Uh, 
um, in the destination for the past four years now. So, well, was, mean, it, was it was it was it quite a, 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 um, a considerable difference in scale? Because I know that in the in France that you had sort of was it twelve. 12 yeah. chalets, and then this was 45 villas. Yeah. So it was quite yeah. a, a significant... Of course, uh, Le Chalet was a real estate opportunity. We bought it. We bought the land next to it. We enlarged a little bit the, uh, the, the initial um, number of rooms. It was only uh, nine at the time initially. Um, uh, but, okay, it, I had to do what I had to do within this framework. Um, we had, I have no choice. I would have loved to have 20 more uh, rooms in, in Le Chalet, but that's the way it is. It gave me the opportunity to launch this new uh, uh, business venture. So, um, But of course, going for a second, third hotel, the idea was to grow to a you know, middle-sized boutique hotel. So 45 rooms for a second hotel. It initially, and I regret, initially uh, we were planning to do 60. But as we were so new and, and without really a lot of experiences, we said, okay, maybe 45 would be enough. The investment is already, you know, X. Um, let's do this second hotel. Then we go step by step. So we did only 45. But today, this hotel with 60 will, will be amazing in terms of financial performance. Um, it's, it's funny because I remind, I mean, before opening uh, and before starting to work on the program of uh, Pumbatang, I went to Southeast Asia and we, uh, with my father, we've uh, met with a couple of key people in the industry just to have a lunch, just to discuss, just to see what kind of information we can collect. And, uh, and uh, I had a meeting with Adrian Zika in Singapore. So we went to have lunch with him and say, okay, this is all hotel project that we have and he loves uh simrap you know for him it's uh, simrap is one of his key destinations that he has in his heart mm -hmm. so he said why well, it's a great destination you should do 60 keys uh, you will see it's the right amount for this destination and and i did it so much and at the end we said okay well we'll see <laughs> um and uh it's funny because he was right he was uh in terms of number of keys 60 keys would have been the perfect um uh, business model for this destination. What, 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 was, you know, what, was, what were some of the um, challenges of working in an emerging market like Siam Rap in Cambodia and, and, um, and also some of the other places? Because it's been interesting to hear how, how, you, how you got the Namib Namibia site because that's a really mm. unusual destination. It is. Um, you know, you have always two sides uh, of for any opportunities, every situation, you, you can have two perspectives, you know. Uh, so, um, I mean, Siem Reap was, I would say, an easy one. It was already quite a well-known destination in terms of cultural side. Uh, of course, that I grown between the time we've invested and built this hotel and today, probably the number of tourism has doubled already. Um, but it was, um, yeah, and, and, and when you have already some, you know, key brands performing well. So I would say Simrad was less risky for a second hotel. Then after that, we took a bit more risk uh, <laughs> because from, from Simrad going to Namibia, which is a beautiful country, but not so well established or well-known on the high-end safari country. Right. Yeah. Uh, um, everybody knows Tanzania, Botswana, South Africa. Today, you've got new destination like Rwanda coming in. But Namibia was not so well uh, publicized or well-known uh, at the time. But I also felt that it was the opportunity for us to promote this destination. And I feel that the brand now is becoming kind of a specialized in trying to go to, you know, unbeaten path or trying to find what would be the next destination because it could be also part of the gain of the brand and part of the global experience to our guests. Instead of saying, okay, we go to in South, you know, in the Mediterranean Sea, let's do an hotel in Ibiza.
Mm. No, we've chosen to go to Menorca because for me, Menorca will be probably the next cool place in that part of the world. So it takes a bit more time, but it also an opportunity for us as we are small. When you go to a destination uh, where all the big boys are there and yep. with you know, a lot of communication budget, with you know, an army behind them, and we are small, you have to be smarter probably and you have to take more risk. So this is what we are trying to do by selecting carefully your destination. Uh, of course, it's calculated risk as well. Huh? We're not going somewhere where nobody is going to come because of X reasons. Um, but when I visited Namibia after the opening, uh, because it was just a few months, six months after the opening of uh, Simra, uh, because we had you know, one of our uh, VIP guests who, who asked me to go and visit the country and visit friends from her. Um, and uh, I was not planning to go to Africa at the time. Yeah. Uh, I was already thinking of, you know, finding the right spot in Vietnam for a beach resort in order to complement the strategy as well in terms of self or Southeast Asia. You know, yeah. My idea when we went to Southeast Asia was like cultural side, city and beach across that region right. so that people you know from around the world coming in that region for two or three weeks they can you know experiment different sites and different culture with us um, so that was the original but then um, when she proposed me to go and visit namibia i'm always curious i like to discover new places and then when i do discover a new place it could be just a new restaurant or thing i like to share it with my family with my kids with my friends uh, and and I took a bit this principle to every time I, I discover something new, cool that I like, I like to to share it with also our guests in your town. So um, so that was yeah that was the, the principle really when I discovered Namibia. I went for three days, traveled across the country, and I found the country just amazing. I was just blown away. I mean, the, the, how, how did how did the, you the, locate the site? So um, the first site was proposed by, like I said, you know, uh, one of our VIP guests at uh, in CM Rep. Um, right. And, uh, and she, she was um, involved with uh, conservation in Namibia through a couple of friends. And those friends um, came to see her while she was staying in my hotel in CM Rep. And uh, um, they we, you know, they, they were like looking for help because there were a big reserve that was for sale, that was for sale just next to their reserve, uh, just outside window. And, uh, and was not the time for her. So she turned to me and said, oh, I don't know, maybe you would be interesting. It's, uh, you know, Namibia is a beautiful place based on your DNA and value. You will like it, go and visit them. So then I uh, went to visit Namibia um, uh, a month later and and I I found the, the country amazing and uh, and of course this friend of Angelina just made me visit this this site and I felt that it was an opportunity because no big international brand was present at the time in the country right uh, so uh, strong local operators uh, strong regional operators um, had lodges in Namibia. But no, no big brands, no, not of the big international uh, commercially big brand. So I felt hmm, maybe we can, you know, promote this nation and become like the only international brand really present in the country. So, you know, I mean, all, all the elements were matching, ticking box, different boxes uh, in order for us to say, okay, let's go and and do the investment and, and, and let's create a new uh, concept. So we did the first launch. And uh, the country is very big. The regions are very different, uh, you know, from north to south to uh, the coast. So I felt that it was important to offer our guests at least two or three or four uh, lodges in order for them to come and travel with Zanya Lodges in Namibia. So um, straight away, when we secured the first sign, I asked, uh, uh, I mean, my, my local partner now, uh, Udi, who is... Uh, uh, very involved with uh, conservations and knows very well the country. He's a native from there. 
and he um, yeah he's been looking from for other potential sites for me and then a year later we secured a second site in the south which is uh, where we built sonar right uh, the tented camp um and then we've been looking also for for a third or fourth destination so i've been visiting a lot of different sites in the country for the past few years of course for the past 12 months we've put everything on standby to wait and see what's going to happen with uh, with the international traveling and uh, but yeah, ultimately, I'd like to have uh, three or four lodges because this is what I mean. They would be much better in terms of experience for guests because today people, a lot of our guests that know the brand, they come to Namibia to discover Namibia because they know us from another hotel in your right. town, and uh, and they come and discover the country uh, because we're there. They feel oh, it's going to be interesting. You know, if they pick that destination, it will be interesting. So they are more picking the hotel brand more than the destination, which is very cool because it feels that, you know, we have created something unique mm. and that now people are trusting the, uh, the brand. Uh, how, how, the do, how do you maintain that consistency of service and of brand in such different locations? It is difficult <laughs> because of course, from culture to culture, uh, uh, the methodology is different. Uh, training is different. Um, yeah. In Southeast Asia, um, I would say uh, people are already a bit more trained skills because tourism exists in that part of the world for, you know, two or three decades already. Um, so it's, it's a bit faster. In Africa, it was a bit more difficult because the level of service the standard is not at the same level. So uh, for sure, um, service HR has been quite a challenge in, mm -hmm. in Namibia. And still, I think it's, it's going to be an ongoing challenge. It's, an, it's an, a daily thing that we have to manage, that we have to monitor, that we have to um, and train people and be behind them and explain them because it, it's a cultural thing. They don't even understand why they should do an effort, why they should even try to build a career for themselves. It's not in their mind. It's not in their culture. Um, they are living on a daily basis. Yeah. You know, it's like uh, they're trying to make a living for today, just, you know, have some money in order to feed, in order to feed the family. And, but they don't have ambitions. They don't have perspectives. So we are trying to make them understand that it would be even better if they start to think differently. So it's not just training on the basics of a business, you know, how to serve, how to do things or uh, how to welcome a guest. It's more than that. What we have to make them understand is that they have to have ambitions. They have to have perspective. They have to build up a life for themselves yeah. uh, through their job. Um, so it's, it's a, a so it's a long work, but uh, that's that's part of the challenge in Namibia. You know, in different parts of the world, you've got different challenges. Sometimes the challenges are on the construction. Sometimes they are on licenses and administration because governments are very tricky. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's uh, with the, the staff because because their culture never trained them, never made them feel the need of. Um, so yeah, in every every. Every single hotel has been a different adventure, which is exciting as well, because at least it's always something new. And uh, I mean, this is what I, I mean, for me, I, it's not a job. What I have today, it's, it's more like a hobby. It's a passion. It's what I do is I don't feel that I'm working. Uh, yeah. It's in my day, every day of my life. And it's, yeah, it's, it's part of um, what I really enjoy doing. So uh, Hospitality is, is uh, you know, it's a very passionate uh, business. And so, if you like it, then you're completely absorbed by, by it. It's, 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 it's not a nine to five. It's not a Monday to Friday job, you know, especially with when you work with different continents. You know, even if we're a small brand, we're already on uh, three different continents. I mean, four now because I've got a project in the pipeline. Of course, in, I mean, maybe, you know, in, in Mexico. So we are on the you know, uh, different uh, time zone. So I've got emails day and night and, and WhatsApp day and nights 
from from construction issues, design, HR, guest related, whatever. <laughs> so uh, yeah, target. <laughs> Now, Vietnam, the, 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 the hotel that you've been doing in Vietnam is probably, am I right in thinking it, that's the largest one? That's the largest yeah, in scale? Yeah. It's, uh, to date, it's the biggest one with 71 keys, yep. uh, five being families, so double, so in 76 rooms in total. Plus, yep. we've got two residences, a four-bedroom and a three-bedroom residence. For the first time, we've uh, launched the residence program because we had uh, a lot of guests who discovered the brand, who also discovered our interior design approach, mm-hmm. and they really liked it. And, uh, and we had some requests from, from customers asking us to work on the design of their house. Or, and, and, you know, it's, it's a different game. So we said no. But we said that maybe there's an opportunity to, uh, to build residences with this interior design unique approach that we have uh, in order to sell those uh, residences, but still manage uh, and and put it then place them in their rental pool program and uh, yeah bison in vietnam is the first time we do it we will do it as well in mexico right um, so let's see that's a that's a new uh, new adventure for us as well and and you you were saying that these well a, a place like vietnam is obviously a, a, a a kind of thriving economy in many ways, or it's kind of growing. It's kind of yes, it's growing very, very fast. Um, probably the fast growing economy in all Southeast Asia. Um, so we're quite lucky with this, um, you know, big crisis that we're living in at the moment. And for the past twelve months now, opening, you know, uh, the biggest hotel for the brand, uh, the most ambitious and financially. Um, project because it's a project on 100 hectares you know it's quite large it's uh, I mean the site is unbelievable um, it's been working six years on it so as you can imagine it's it's uh, quite ambitious for us you know we are still a family a private group you know we don't have any financial uh, external investors so it's pure uh, family driven right so it's um, when all this crisis started I was like the most ambitious program for us. And then we're going to have to open in a probably the most incredible crisis ever. Um, but I found out that because this country of Vietnam is so economically dynamic, that in fact, just the internal market, and it's a big country, 95 million people in Vietnam. So it's a, it's a big country. Um, in fact, this project of Vice and No is doing very well with the local market only. And we've got bookings coming in, you know, every day and they're very, very good. Uh, I was surprised. I was very worried initially. So we were supposed to open in August and I pushed back the date to December uh, because the seasonality, you know, September, October, November is not the best season. It's more like, like November is the hard of the typhoon season in South Asia. Yeah. Okay, let's push it to December. So we're going to open slowly and, and then stepping in the uh, the good season in terms of weather, uh, which is from February to, to end of August, September. And uh, and we said, okay, let's hope. So we, we did special packages for the locals. But then when I was on site in January, I said, we have to do, you know, we have to stop the discount and all the special packages for the market, for the local market, because this market is very wealthy. There's demand, there's people, um, you know, it's, it, it's not a growing country. It's already a very well-developed country. It's unbelievable. Huh? We've got the misinterpretation sometimes of, uh, from, from abroad, from, you know, another side of the world. You feel that it's a growing country or it's not, but it's not. I mean, you go to Saigon today, I mean, so many concepts in terms of food and beverage, bars, very creative, incredible chef. You feel like you're in New York or London huh, sometimes. It's wow. unbelievable. Uh, it's booming. And people are going out. I mean, in the evening, it's, the roads are packed with young people on, the, on, on people on their scooters and chatting. And, and they are already super trendy with all the brands and things. I mean, the influence of the international influences there. I mean. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, optimistic about Baisano. Um, 
I was, you know, very, very happy uh, to see the results uh, of six years of work because, as you can imagine, since March last year, which was my last visit on site, until the opening in December, I couldn't visit the site. And the last eight, nine months of a construction are crucial, of course. Yeah. So many details to finalize, to, you know, make choices and, and decisions. So um, I was a bit afraid, but then the result is, is great. Uh, just a few mistakes, but nothing major that is being, you know, uh, changed right now. And, uh, and the product is great. The, the, another element also that surprised me positively is that because of our Zen Hotel positioning being humble, being authentic, being very local, yeah. I always felt that that concept was, will mostly seduce international guests, people coming from abroad to know more about uh, Vietnamese culture, want to be immersed in this culture, wants to eat you know, authentic Vietnamese and, and, and visit the community, visit the villages. So I felt that, you know, it would work for, I was convinced it would work for international guests. But um, as, a, mm, uh, as it's a newly uh, dynamic economy, I said maybe the wealthier people will be looking for a different kind of luxury, that it's maybe not the luxury that I've created there. So that was another element where it was a 100% sure it would work. And in fact, I was there during the New Year, the Chinese New Year, the Tet, uh, which is very important for them uh, over there. So the hotel was uh, quite busy and met a lot of, uh, of guests. And, and the Vietnamese, because they are so uh, proud of their culture, you know, it's a very strong culture, Vietnamese there. Um, and they just love it. They're so proud that an international brand came to their country and has created a concept based on the true value and DNA of their culture, they never seen that. They just never seen it. None of the international brand comes and, and try to, you know, um, uh, compose an entire concept based on their value, on their way of living, on their traditions. Um, and that's what we did. And they are so proud that they, they loved it. Um, of course, we had to adapt. We see that, for example, uh, Vietnamese, they're not too much into sports. So all the sports experiences are not working so well at the moment. It will be probably uh, work better when the international business will come in. Uh, but they love food and they stay like three hours in the restaurant and they try the entire menu. And they, because they are big families and they just, it's so crucial for them. Um, mm -hmm. And luckily, because we are so traditional and authentic, our menu were already based on a very traditional Vietnamese uh, food culture. So they loved it. And they were surprised because normally, you know, international brands, they always bring kind of a fusion, more international flavor. But us, we like to do things local. Um, so it worked uh, for, for the local community as well, which is great. How important is it the the architecture in your brand? I and mean, we've, we've spoken a little bit about this. And how do you work with designers and architects? What makes a good relationship between you as the hotelier and the architect or designers of the of these extraordinary properties? Um, but one of the key elements uh, from day one. Um, why I wanted to go into hospitality was because while I was traveling as a guest, I never really felt, I never really found an interior, um, a, a mood, uh, an architecture that fits my taste, yep. really. Um, so, of course, one of the key elements and a key foundation of Zen Hotel was to create architecture and interior design based on what I personally like. And uh, so that's why, I mean, from day one, uh, interior design is nearly, is done in-house. It's uh, integrated in our group. Um, and, uh, and what we do is we try to find support of uh, architect office. So every time we change in order to also learn, mm -hmm. because, you know, this is not my background, I just learn uh, architectural interior design 
on those projects, one after the other. Um, so I like to learn. I like to also challenge my ideas with people from this business who can give me some, you know, uh, new directions and new interpretation. So every time we've worked with a different architect, um, sometimes international office, because it's, uh, you know, uh, it's easier also to work with the Paris based office than working with the Vietnamese office. It means that during the 18 months of the design process, it would mean traveling to Vietnam on a regular basis. So, so, so it depends. Sometimes we work like, for example, in Namibia, we work with a um, South African uh, architect office. Um, but we are not, when we select the architect office, we are not looking for the signature. We are not looking for the brand name because we know exactly what we stand for, what yeah. we want and what we don't want. Um, we are very precise in terms of creations and, 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 and concept. Uh, most of the time, the concept come from us. Uh, I mean, when we visit a new site, we've got the, the initial ideas. Oh, I see this or that. We should do that. Nah, 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 nah. Then we make some local research as well. So we really start the process uh, of designing with the uh, local architect once we already have made our mind in terms of what would be the best interpretations in architecture for that site, for that culture, for that part of the world, or for that building. Um, and then we start to brainstorm with the architect, see how much they can bring us. And then we start the entire design process, but we are really hands on them I mean, from day one. Right. On a regular basis, like every two weeks a meeting for like a year, year and a half. Um, and then all the interior design, FFNE, West and it's all uh, done in house, design in house. So that's why now uh, what we are trying to do is to sell also that service because um, uh, up to now, we've been working on our own hotels, but we did one program in Ghent in Belgium that was an investor, you know, an outside investor. Um, and we have sold our interior design also as a consultant um, because I don't want to manage an hotel that is not truly a Zanyu hotel from A to Z. Right. So, um, if, if an investor call us and say, oh, I like your kind of brand, but the hotel is already existing or it's already designed and you just have to come and manage it, so, no, sorry, I'm not interested. For me, uh, it's so important because my ambition is to build a trademark, is to yeah. build a name, a strong name. For me, all the value of my work is within the name that I'm building, which I hope in 15 years from now will have a certain value on the market. And for that, I don't want to make any compromise. And I want every single hotel to be a true Zanya product, um, to be a full experience for my guest. Uh, I don't want the guest to come in and say, mm, I don't understand why this or that, or I don't feel the same. Or, And this is a bit the, uh, the pressure that all the big groups have, where they have to build up their portfolio of hotel based on pure financial management contract and not creating experience to a yeah. guest. Uh, so I don't want to, to make compromise uh, while building this brand. Otherwise, I won't succeed. Um, so for example, the, the Mexican project, so we've got two hotels in the pipeline with the same investor. And we said to this investor, of course, they come and picked us up because they liked what they saw. They didn't come just for the management. Mm for a season or somebody else, you know, they, would, they were coming for the entire concept. Uh, so, of course, um, they understood from day one that they, didn't, they need to let us design, create and design also the place. Uh, so this is what we're doing at the moment. So the first hotel in Mexico is uh, under construction. Uh, we're just working on the, on the FFNU SNE, where we're designing all the furniture, the key furniture at the moment. Uh, but we also work with a lot of antiques, as you might have seen, which is a big job, which is nearly 18 months to two years process, process before the opening, because we want to uh, always integrate within our interior design a lot of antiques, because it gives uh, a vibe that no new furniture can give you. I mean, right. it's, a, it's a key element uh, in our concept. 
Um, and uh, but it's a, it's a tough job. Again, that's something that we can do because we are a small brand, we are passionate, and we're willing to go through the pain. <laughs> but uh, I don't think a big group will do that because it's impossible. We are just picking piece by piece. <laughs> a crazy job. Um, you know, every, a lot of our, I mean, all our antiques are just individual pieces that we just identify. So now we have a new process uh, with the team uh, in order to uh, identify and collect those pieces. But uh, it's not easy, especially when you go to Asia for a project like Baisano. It's been two years of trying to find the right sources for antiques over there. Then we had Africa, which is a different kind of uh, network and sourcing for antiques. France, of course, it's a bit easier because in Europe, you find a lot of antiques, especially in Belgium, uh, a lot of those sort of pieces. Uh, and now we are starting with, uh, with Mexico. So we've got a dedicated team on site to just going uh, you know, on a weekly basis in antique shops, in markets, in trying and take pictures sent to us by WhatsApp. We said, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> this is how we do it. Extraordinary. Yeah. So, so it, sound, it sounds like you've, you've, you've weathered the COVID storm relatively well. Must have been pretty dicey last year. So when it came in in March, I took the decision to close all the hotels straight away yeah. because we didn't know where we were going, um, whatever, in terms of security for guests, for staff. Right. Um, and we have no vision at all. Uh, I mean, the, the governments were we did. in the dark. Uh, yeah. So we said, okay, let's close. Let's see what's going to happen. So we closed all the hotels until June, May, June. Uh, and then slowly we said, okay, let's try to see if there's an opportunity with local market because border was still closed. Um, and we reopened um, most of the hotel, um, Namibia and Com uh, Cambodia as well. Um, Vietnam was not, we decided to push the opening to December. Uh, Le Chalet is only open in the, uh, in the winter season. So it was not a question for it. Um, and we, yeah, work with our sales team, with the marketing, with the communication, trying to target more the local markets. So in certain places, it works better than others uh, because there's a local market, potential local market. Some places are more difficult. In Cambodia, it's not bad, but it's, it's not easy. Um, we had to find also agreement with our staff in order that, it, you know, in order to keep everyone that they would work on, you know, on a shift basis. They come to work for one week, then they stay home for two weeks so that everybody has a job, everybody. So we had to find different deals with uh, all our staff across the collection. Um, but everybody is pleased, everybody's happy that, you know, we made the effort as well to keep them uh, on the payroll. Um, of course, they had to also share the efforts and, uh, uh, but it's working pretty well. And, um, now and it's been reopened for you know, a bit more than six months and you know we, we we we're happy because hotels are open it's the best way to maintain um mm. you know an hotel otherwise it can degrade quite quickly yes uh, and you have to protect your assets you know yeah. it's an investment it's a big investment so it's the best way uh you keep the employees on the payroll you keep them trained you keep them working you keep them motivated um so and yeah and at the moment as long as you don't lose money if you break even then i'm more than happy so this is what you know we're experiencing uh for the past six months it's been a bit difficult at the beginning but now we reach a level of business that is quite decent and uh, most of our products are breaking even now so i'm happy more than happy so uh, let's see i hope international travelers will come in again uh I guess probably after the summer, uh, I think uh, we need to uh, uh, still continue this vaccination campaign worldwide. And um, but hopefully, in Europe, we'll be a bit more advanced by May, June. Um, so maybe by September, they will open up borders. Um, but I mean, Namibia, for example, you can already travel with just a seventy-two hours PCR test, which is nothing. I mean, right. Okay. You just do the test, and you just travel, and you're free in the country to. Uh, to do whatever you have to do. So we already have some international travelers 
I flew there in November and I was surprised to, uh, to see that, you know, 30% of our guests are international, 70% local. It's, it's working okay. We survive. Great. It's not easy. Uh, I feel that we are losing two years of expansion because, of course, this is a period where there's no expansion. There's, uh, you know, it's trying to uh, keep tight uh, to go through this tough time. And but uh, and we have a choice. <laughs> and and what's what's beyond? You said you've uh, you've talked a little bit about Mexico. Do is there anything else on the horizon? Um, yes, I mean, after that, uh, those two projects, so the second project in Mexico is in design process. Um, hopefully we can start construction this year. It's, it's about 12 months difference uh, between the first and second project. So normally by end of this year, we'll be able to start construction of the second one. Um, we still have a project in uh, Menorca that uh, we've... Um, started a long time ago and Menoka is a destination which is incredible but in terms of getting your license is just impossible right uh, which is a nightmare which is a shame because based on our value we are so uh, protective of the environment of the culture of everything and uh, and it's a shame that they don't let us do what we propose so we are fighting we are still fighting trying uh, changing, modifying things in order to get there. So hopefully one day we'll have a, a Menokin project. Um, we have, um, I mean, lately, I mean, for the past three months, we have received some yeah, interest from third investors I and mean, from party investors. Uh, um, a, a major family in, in Germany um, mm. identified us as being a potential management company as well for a very uh, interesting program. Um, more in the well-being um, theme, which is interesting for us because well-being is becoming more and more important for brand. Yeah. Um, we have uh, also been uh, selected uh, for a tender for a very, very ambitious project in the south of France that I cannot say yet. Uh, but if we are selected, uh, it could be a game changer for us. Um, it's very ambitious. Probably the most ambitious project I mean, Five Star Hotel for, for the south of France Mediterranean. Um, so I'm very excited about it. Um, we have uh, been also receiving some interest from Vietnam since we've opened. I've got two groups who would like us to do something for them, but I'm not sure it's the right time. I think we have to push first by Sano. And I don't, I don't like to do the same thing twice. Uh, I like to go for new challenges every time. Um, so I'm not sure... Uh, we'll do, you know, once we have done something that works well, just do a replicate in the same region based on the same DNA. Uh, I don't see the point. I mean, in terms of experience, I don't see the point. Financially, of course, it's interesting. And that's why groups always try to have clusters of hotel in, right. in the different region. Um, but uh, no, it's not so exciting for me. So I prefer to wait and see for you know every time something completely fresh completely new um, it's more exciting for for the team and more exciting also for the guests fascinating i know that's a perfect place for us to conclude the conversation that's been an absolutely fascinating insight into the growth and development of, of zanier and how you've gone about executing your your projects so thank you so much for sharing your, your story and your expertise and uh, it's been a pleasure thank you very much have a good day and that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. 
you can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.